All right, good evening, everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And tonight I'm talking about Bell's palsy. So again, Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist and also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. So Gates Brain Health, we work with chronic autoimmune and chronic neurological conditions. I try to bring you these talks um, weekly, if not more than once a week. And Bell's palsy is not an uncommon neurological condition. Probably many of you have known someone with Bell's palsy. Um, so, so it's a, an interesting condition to those who don't have it. To those who do have it, actually it can have significant psychological consequences um, because about 10% of people don't make a full recovery. And so hopefully from this video, you'll have a better understanding of what do you do if Bell's palsy does affect you or how can you help a friend who has it? And uh, we'll go through some of the literature on this. <clears throat> I wasn't able to get the streaming software to work tonight. So I'll just kind of be uh, ad-libbing and, and going through this how I used to. So your seventh cranial nerve originates here approximately in the pons. It emanates from this lateral aspect of the pons. The pons is the middle part of your brainstem. The top of your brainstem is the mesencephalon, also known as the midbrain. In this middle part of your brainstem, that's called the pons, where my middle finger is. And down below, this is your medulla oblongata, as it's termed, and or also commonly referred to as the medulla, outside of uh, some Hollywood movies. And hello to everyone who's joining. So the seventh cranial nerve, known as the facial nerve, uh, is the primary nerve involved with Bell's palsy. Now, uh, for undergrad students and uh, students going through their doctoral programs early on, they may get confused in that you may think of the facial nerve as being a sensory nerve. It largely is not. It does carry sensation from the anterior two-thirds of your tongue. But largely, it's a motor nerve involving facial expression, those types of activities. And so frequently, doctors during a neurological exam will test patients for their ability to raise their eyebrows or close their eyes as hard as they can. That's an important one, so remember that. Smiling, blowing out their cheeks, spreading your nostrils, browning your chin, so to speak, activating your platysma muscle. That is your platysma muscle. In fact, uh, my, uh, my best friend, we often would show off our platysma muscles when we were going through school, kind of as a joke, is, is you know, someone may flex their biceps, we we're flexing our platysma muscles. But the facial nerve coordinates all of that. And if you've ever seen someone with weakness of, the, of their facial musculature, um, you may notice a few things. They may not be able to smile. They may not be able to close their eye. They may not be able to raise an eyebrow. And there are important distinctions in terms of basically where the level of the weakness is for diagnosis. The facial nerve coordinates everything on one side of the face, upper aspect of the face and the lower aspect of the face. Very, very significant. Whereas, well, and let me say it this way. If there's involvement of the facial nerve, you're going to see weakness of the upper and the lower aspect of the face. If there is something like a stroke involving the pathways from the contralateral hemisphere down to, it's always backwards on this, so forgive me, the contralateral hemisphere to the opposite side of the face, you're going to see weakness in the lower aspect of the face, the lower facial quadrant or it can involve some of the pathways running down through the brainstem and the pons before they cross over. Now, to be specific, uh, there are some nuances to this. Some people have kind of different innervation of their upper and lower facial musculature. Um, that has to be taken into account. But generally, even with something like a stroke involving, over here, the frontal cortex or the pathways running out of the frontal cortex involving facial control, there will be some minor weakness of the upper facial muscles over here, typically with closing the eyes. So with closing the eyes, if you ask somebody to really close their eyes really hard, 
you'll see one eye kind of excuse me <laughs> i'm trying to look while i'm doing this that's stupid but as they close their eyes you'll see one eye start to open up a little bit um and then you'll see a weakness of smiling uh something like that and um, you'll see the weakness primarily down in the lower facial quadrant with something like a cerebrovascular accident it's also important to note with a cerebrovascular accident you may have other symptoms so you may have weakness in other parts of your body you may have dizziness you may just feel really fatigued lethargic confused you may have double vision um, you may have nausea you may be vomiting so you may have a horrible headache so those are the other symptoms that doctors are looking for when we're evaluating facial weakness and those are the things that we're thinking whereas the bell's palsy patient is going to present largely with just the unilateral upper and lower facial weakness they may complain of some pain around the ear this is always so backward again confused uh, forgive me so they may have some pain around the ear or the jaw but you're going to see this demonstrable usually weakness of the upper and lower facial quadrant uh, and that's typically how it presents it's thought that being exposed to cold environments or being under stress may be precipitating factors um, reactivation of the herpes simplex virus is thought to be one of the more common causes some authors speculate that it's an autoimmune reaction affecting the facial nerve uh, hiv can affect it lyme neuroborreliosis as it's termed can cause bell's palsy also there's a lot of discussion and i got to be careful how i term this let's say the current global health crisis the infection involved um, some authors are speculating that that is a more common cause of uh, bell's palsy as well as the immunological treatment that's being used uh, to uh, prevent or prophylactically prevent this infection that there's a lot of discussion in the literature that that may have a side effect so those are things to consider in light of bell's palsy now <clears throat> what they know on MRI scans is that when they look within the cerebellopontine angle let me see here let's turn it this way and there so the cerebellopontine angle involves this area largely the fifth seventh and eighth cranial nerves are going to be involved in this region and they can see that the facial nerve in this cisternal area as it's termed tends to be swollen so they see that those who have bell's palsy have signs of swelling of their facial nerve as compared to the healthy side and it's it's a nuanced swelling so it involves detailed measurements and through time you're going to see more and more brain mris um, being interpreted through artificial intelligence that's just my take on it so we're seeing more and more artificial intelligence technologies being able to quantify differences in you know structures within the brain nonetheless um, that's one thing that could be seen i mentioned the viral infection aspect inflammation autoimmunity and doctors typically are going to do the exam that i mentioned they may also test taste at the anterior two-thirds aspect of the tongue the medical model for Bell's palsy is typically to put people on antiviral medications and corticosteroids. Uh, prednisolone is the most common steroid used. There are um, differing thoughts on this. Some people argue for intratympanic use of prednisolone as well. Uh, but steroids seem to be the mainstay thing that everybody agrees on. But most patients I see come out of the urgent care, the ICE, or um, the ER, on an antiviral medication and on a corticosteroid. There was some thought of doing surgical decompression because, again, this nerve can be swollen. And that nerve is not only swollen in that region I mentioned. Uh, let me see if I can point to it here, the cerebellopontine angle, but also it may be swollen as it goes through the petrous portion of the temporal bone. So neurosurgeons and ENTs were doing surgeries, but there's a lot of risks and uh, they have to justify the benefits in doing that. 
The alternative model, uh, acupuncture has a lot of notoriety. Manipulative acupuncture has notoriety. Chiropractors have been talking about adjustments in Bell's palsy for a long time. And then neuromodulation also can be used. So in our office at Gates Brain Health, we use a lot of neuromodulation, which is electrical stimulation, trying to wake up um, the damaged nerve, so to speak, and trying to get it function better again. Uh, if you are afflicted with Bell's palsy, you probably want to not only go to the emergency room and get an, an accurate uh, diagnosis because other things can masquerade as Bell's palsy. And it's not completely uncommon for things like cancer to be affecting the facial nerve or to have a subtle stroke that you know a neuroradiologist has to see that's really, really mild or, or small that's affecting the facial nerve. So getting a detailed workup, again, I'm not giving medical advice in this, in this talk, but generally the recommendation is to get a really detailed neurological workup for the condition to make sure it is Bell's palsy, to make sure there's nothing else causing the facial nerve to be damaged. And then also in some centers, they do um, facial nerve neurography, which is a type of EMG where they see how much activation there is in the musculature of the face. If there's less than 33% activation in the face, that's a poor prognostic sign. Also, if, you're, if your weakness has not rehabilitated within one month, that's a poor prognostic sign. Um, there are different uh, inventories used. Um, House Brackman, I think, is one of the more common ones. Uh, so you can look those up, inventories used for judging the severity of the facial paresis. But um, if you're not better in a month, then I would, and you've been on corticosteroids and you've been on antivirals, I'd really start looking for other approaches that may help for the, uh, the Bell's palsy to be remediated. So... And that is the story. Hello again to everyone who's joined, and my heart goes out to um, any of you who have had this. Uh, send me your questions. I think I covered everything I needed to, and um, hopefully be back tomorrow with another broadcast. All right, good night, everyone.